in the hospital, the, the, the test area looks like um, a screen. How many people in here ever ordered an ant farm? Look at that. I know there's some people, they just want to hold their hands up, uh-huh. I ordered an ant farm, but every, whenever my ants came in, they were all dead and shriveled up, you know. So in Georgia, I put ants in there. Mm -hmm. Keep, right. I put fire ants in mine, buddy. Nobody messed with my ant farm. So, thing looks like an ant farm type screen, and it has a solution in it, it's made of saline. You dump in the enzymes and hormones in there, you fire electrical charge through, the electrons go in a straight line, the little enzymes and hormones get the hot for the electrons and chase them like Pac-Man. Some run faster and slower than others, you get a layer effect, and that is how you separate enzymes and hormones here on Earth to manufacture vaccines and serums. Okay, great, that's not so hard to understand. But there's a problem with every hospital on Earth. It's in a gravity field. So the ortho medical doctors said that we got a problem. It looks like an old 60s lava lamp. You can fire a billion volts here and it still won't separate because of the gravity field. So we built a machine that interfaced up there, had McDonnell Douglas put it on Discovery, and Charlie Walker go to work up there, the first civilian commercial astronaut. Yay, Charlie. So, Keep left. Charlie had nothing to do with NASA. He's just uh, an employee of McDonnell Douglas. Charlie fires up his grid and clears all the way to the bottom in the first pass. And there they found what they were looking for. Hormones. Four times larger and 700 times pure than anything existed on Earth. They separate them. They bring them back to Emory University of Atlanta, Georgia. So we get there with, um, at Emory. And this is six years ago. On Channel 5, they say those of you in the Emory area whose pancreas doesn't produce beta cells, more commonly known as diabetes. Come on in, we got the project to try. They screen out four people, and they're in their 20, 40, 60, and 80 year bracket, and they give them an intravenous injection. The space hormone with this purity works like a genetic encoder, a roadmap, goes straight to their pancreas, start a catalytic conversion in the pancreas, changes everything but itself, and after about years and years of being class 2 diabetic and people Keep lay their needles right. down and they haven't had an insulin shot in six years so you're sitting there going well why well you hadn't heard anything about it for two reasons johnson johnson paid 227 million dollars for the research flight they locked it up under proprietary law oh god mean people conspiracy right eh, wrong answer they did it for reason number two have you ever tried to do a manufacturing process in the backseat of your car? That's what it's like on board a space shuttle. You need a space factory in order to, with a facility bigger than this room so you can inoculate serum batches big enough to take out entire cities at a time, not just four people, until we have the United States space station called Freedom. Boy, I was wondering if you like PR, great PR job on that. Freedom. If we ever get Space Station Freedom Belt, we would say we, in our in-house joke, freedom at last. So, anyhow, until we have a facility like that, there's nothing they can do about it. However, the potential cure for diabetes is laying in space. Now, you might ask yourself something, wait, wait a minute, I just saw Bill Clinton get $2 billion last week to the Diabetic Research Foundation. Mm-hmm. Clinton doesn't know a thing about this because it's under proprietary law. How come I can tell you about it? I made the process. So, it's just a matter of time. Keep left. Now, let's do practical applications. How much would a shot like that cost? I always love and ask questions like that. And they said, well, probably about 60,000 for one shot. Phew, <laughs> boy, I guess I'll die with diabetes then. Other people in the room said, no, you won't. We'll pay for it. You know, who are you guys, Daddy Warbucks? Well, we're the insurance underwriters. All of them, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. Well, you are Daddy Warbucks. So anyway, they said, we'll pay for it 100% a normal premium rate. Oh, why are you so generous? Let me figure this one out. Don't tell me. I know. Here's what you'll do. Let's see. You inoculate all these people. Golly, a person goes 80 years with diabetes in their life. Let's see, they get blindness, kidney failure, joint failure, hypertension. It costs you guys hundreds and tens of billions of dollars over their lifetime. You'll put all that money in your pocket. They, the public, get rid of a dread disease. 
Johnson Johnson sitting on a worldwide mono monopoly. And let's see, the guy who makes the machine gets 10 percent of everything. I like this. <laughs> so, I'm telling you, don't buy into all this doom and gloom. If you do, it'll warp you so bad you won't recognize the truth when it hits you right between the eyes. You, you know, all the stuff you heard what I went through when I was a teenager, right? If anybody should be bitter, it should be me, right? Do I look bitter? No. This is the greatest time to be alive right now. God's sake, what's wrong? It's, it's, it's great. It's marvelous being here. Somebody said, well, you can keep trying and trying, you know, and said it just keeps killed. When I, okay, yeah, maybe they'll squash another one. But you know what? I'm persistent. I've got the tenacity of a T-Rex in persistence, all right? You just keep hammering at something. Something my grandmother told me. Little strokes, bell great oaks, okay? You just keep hammering at it. Sooner or later, something's going to get through, and it will. And you don't get downtrodden about it, because if you do, the minute you get depressed, or you think they can control you, or what good can I do? I'm only one person then they got you. They can kill this body, they can torture it, you can throw in disease, whatever the hell you want to do to it, but you can't take my free will, you'll never have me. Don't that just piss you off? <laughs> so, that's the thing. It's a great time to be alive, and it's going to be a great time as we move to the next century. This is just the beginning of the stuff we can do out there. You know, I know all this stuff, I'm frustrated with NASA, you know, and God knows what they're up to right now because um, they're doing some crazy things. And um, it's ridiculous. The space program that we have today is not the one you remembered of the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo days. And it's the it's same company name, different, different employees, entirely different type of people. They have a different type of agenda, and guess what, you're not invited. So it's not right. We're gonna change it up, but the only way I can change it is to tell you about all this stuff. So if I'm doing all this stuff, why am I in a little group of UFO Congress here in Laughlin? Because that's how you start a major fire, you know? You start a little spark here, get bigger and bigger and bigger, and guess what? There's enough pressure by enough up people upset out there that it gives me some leverage out there on Capitol Hill. And yeah, the system does work. Now, that one medical project I told you about is one of 1,400 78 medical pharmaceuticals lined up to be made out there. The one I told you about is a minor one. You want to see the other stuff. We don't have time. You know about human insulin now. Um, Psychoprinsin, urokinase. That's not a Soviet soft drink, okay? What is urokinase? It's a very expensive substance. Actually, it's a substance made by your kidneys, but only 5% of your kidneys will produce it. Why? Gravity stops the other 95% of your kidneys produce enough of it. What does it do? It gets inside and it prevents blood clots. It's a natural blood declutter. However, with all the garbage and crap and stuff we're eating, with all the everything that's packed into it, and I'm guilty of that, McDonald's, here I come. So anyway, our blood can't take care of it. The little 5% is not enough, so we've had to make it synthetically. We make it synthetically, it is so expensive, it makes cocaine look like a bargain per gram, all right? However, in space, we made some of it. We made a five-gallon bucket of it for about three bucks. Why? Because the gravity field wasn't there and allowed us to do the entire process at just a fraction of the cost. Imagine the type of stuff we can make in the medical arena. Now, let's jump to another one. Electronic crystals. Okay, look at that arm. The arm of that cargo, out the cargo bay, has got a hold of a canister. A canister is coming out of this rack and its entire rack is a process system we call a quartz crystal growing farm. Quartz crystal, what is it? It's on the face of my watch, QURATV. What is a quartz crystal? It's the heart and soul of the electronic industry today. It's inside our computers, our calculators, our stereophonic equipment, and um, we can grow these crystals. I know, well, crystals are like rocks. How do they grow? Well, we can grow them through an electrochemical reaction. When crystals grow here on Earth, they look like this, they're nice and linear. Nice, nice looking crystal starting there. And then every crystal on Earth starts that. You know what that is? It's the same demon I've been telling you about. Gravity convection flaws come in and messes up the crystals. Well, we grew some crystals out in space. They didn't come back that same size. No, they came back in one third the time, but they came back 
10 times the size of a crystal grown on Earth. The top half of this photo, oh, there's the machine that we did this with. Anybody recognize that name? Rockwell International. It's not science fiction, y'all. Here's the computer that sets up the program for the coordinates that comes in. This is a camera shooting the window so we can see what's going on. And now I'm going to show you a slide of what's happening inside that growth crystal chamber. That is called a float zone crystal growth experiment. The top half of this photo is an x-ray view of a crystal grown on Earth. See all the gravity convection streaks? The bottom half of this photo is an x-ray view of a crystal grown in space. Totally flawless. Well, what's these specs? That's dirt on my film. So, what good would that be? Well, first thing you can do with these things, you can have a lot of fun with them with colleagues. First thing we did was build a 555 computer chip. You know anything about computer chips? That's common as dirt. So we send the chips over to Cray 3 Silicon Valley, the big Cray 3 computers. Those computers are the size of this room. They're cooled 420 degrees below zero, liquid nitrogen cooled. Why? Because they turn six billion calculations per second. If you didn't cool them like that, they'd melt down to the floor. All right? Very powerful machine. So we give uh, send those crystals over. They look at them, you know, you guys crazy? That's common as dirt. Ah, plug it in the test bed and tell us what you think of capacity size. So they go to that, but to make sure it's on test bed. You hear that? Say it to me. Test bed. Okay. So they put it in a test bed. Now about 30 minutes later, we get a call back. The guy's going, <laughs> and um, you're a fire extinguisher and screaming in the background. <laughs> yes. You know, and uh, uh, we got a power reading on this thing just before the test bed blew off the floor, hit the ceiling, and ricocheted down on the wall here. Uh, it's got a power reading of 15,000 times the capacity of any crystal on Earth. What did you do, hijack a UFO? I went, close. Um, made this thing in space. So um, I said, hey, uh, let me talk to the medical systems of Cray 3. You don't have anything loaded over there, do you? I went, no, man. So, uh, so we got to talk to the computers. Now, the med systems computers are most and uh, nearly all of the medical knowledge of this planet loaded in this thing. And it can give you a hand when you ask the right questions. But here's the trick. You've got to ask the right questions. So I asked the question, to what purpose would this serve if we would apply this technology to a neurosynaptic firing order that's been damaged in a carbon data unit? What does that mean? It means what if somebody had a spinal injury? So the computer thought about it. We downloaded the information and it came back with an interesting scenario. It said, you have a 16-year-old girl, she's going to be the best Olympic swimmer and diver we ever have. She's practicing, she does a dive, she misses, she hits her head on the edge of the pool, we get her out. The water, we look at her, she has severed her spinal column, she's a quadriplegic for the rest of her life. End of her dreams, right? <coughs> Wrong answer. What we'll do is this. First thing we'll do, we'll take her to surgery and open up her spinal column, we'll fix her vertebrae through bone marrow fusion, and then this is where it gets interesting. Do you know that three pound of gray matter in your skull called your brain? It's the most logic rhythm computer known to, on the universe to us. I know you're sitting there going, I know he's wrong now because that person over there hadn't got a lick of logic in their head, right? <laughs> well, I'm afraid you're wrong, they do. Now, what we can do is replicate. What do we want to replicate? Do you know when you have an original thought like this, you jump? Do you know what just happened? You know why people sometimes jump? That animation is not really exaggerated, it's really a reaction to something. When you have an original thought, a tiny lightning bolt will fly from one side of your head at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, to the other side. Pure thought is pure energy and that's a pure fact. So if you get a whole bunch of original thoughts, you got all these little lightning bolts running across there, and you get all these thoughts at one time, you have a brainstorm. Come on, y'all. All right. All right, you're slow. I always warn audiences. I didn't warn you, but that's okay. It's, just, it's your problem now. Whenever you're slow on something like that, I will penalize you with a cow joke. <laughs> what do you call a cow with all four legs cut off? Ground beef. <laughs> what do you call a cow that's had an abortion? This is not nasty. The cow has been decaffeinated. 
good. You win, you win a space crystal for the day. Now, you know who told me those jokes? Chuck Yeager. You ever heard of him? Chuck and I are born in the same state, West Virginia, and uh, when he tells you a joke, watch out. He'll, he'll honestly God, elbow you. He's corny as he can be, and I love that man to death. He's such a trip. So anyway, um, back to the surgery room. What we'll do is this. You got a little brainstorm going on there. All these messages are being fired from your brain down to your conduit wiring, better known as your spinal column. And it, on this grill, it comes to a dead end stop as a break. What do we do? We take the capacity power of this crystal. I'll reduce that Cray 3 computer, the size of this room, down to the size of my little nail, my little finger. You implant it in her, do an interface and a neural synaptic firing orders. And just like a traffic cop directing traffic, it picks up the signal, sends it on through at the speed of light, and sends it on into all the neurons that fire up the muscles. And a little bit of therapy, she goes on to win the Olympics and have a nice life for the rest of her life. And all this information has just been sent to Christopher Reeves and the Man of Steel is going to walk again one day. So. Now, all this stuff may seem weird to you. Well, it should because we call it weird science. You ever heard the term? If one has happened, what an appropriate place we would be in. I'm in the weird science category. And um, it's just we're so far edged out there, we are beyond our own infrastructure. Now, that's really important. What does that mean? That means that we're, we discover these things, but we can't really apply them yet because we don't have the infrastructure to help us. It happens all the time. It happened in, in World War II. How so? You built and designed a Manhattan Project that split the atom. What did we do with it? We built a warhead. All we did was release energy. It wasn't until 40 years later we decided to build nuclear reactors. Why couldn't we do it in 1945? Because we didn't have computers and technology built all around that could hold that type of technology. Same thing's happening here. You're getting to see Manhattan Project technology, and it'll be a while before we can get infused because we don't have the infrastructure yet. Now, that leads me to another subject area. While I was at Roswell, they tagged me up with a guy named Colonel Corso. Heard of him? And um, <laughs> Colonel's a trip, man. Um, they, what, was it 84 or 82 or 84? 82. And uh, he's really neat. He's got, got his pants pulled up around his chest. <laughs> Looks like Mr. Rogers or, or, no, Tim Conway, you know, when he walks. But I like the colonel. Don't get me wrong. I really like the colonel. He's all right. And um, he's really done you a big service because you remember in his book, The Day After Roswell, what does he say? That alien technology has been infused into our system. Look familiar, all? Okay. What's happening is our infrastructure. Okay, what's this got to do with anything? It's got to do everything with everything. 20 years ago, you had no cellular phones, power books, fiber optic, cellular, pagers, satellite information that the magnitude you're carrying on the internet. Goes straight on. World Wide Web. You didn't have any of that. So where'd that all come from? All of a sudden, we jump in computers. We go from vacuum tubes to transistor to microcircuitry board. Step, step, step. Okay, it looks pretty good. But now, in technology, there's just these massive jumps. You know, how do we do that kind of stuff? Because we cheated on the test, y'all. If we were doing long division, remember the old teacher? Show me your work, you know. You can't show me the work. You can show me the product, and we'll use it. But you can't show me the work. Of course, those dead on target, when they started dumping that technology in, it created a job field for me. Because by transferring this high tech into more reduced applications, we bring up the infrastructure. When the infrastructure comes up, we can then utilize that really cutting edge technology. Then what happens, the infrastructure of that system builds the other infrastructure faster, then you infuse even more technology. Look at technology. What has it been doing? Exponential jumping. All right? In the last 20 years, we have accomplished more in technology than the other 5,000 years of our previous existence. Now, you want to explain that one to me on a 3D logical term? Guess what? You can't. 
all right? So you're sitting there going, oh, he's just fantasizing, right? Well, let's see about that then. But we're going to go look at something else right now. We're going to skip to the other part of the program. And I'm going to show you. By the way, if you want to know what all this stuff is about, oh, we'll come back to a couple things to get time. But there's just too much here. Um, all right. Now, I brought, here we go. I'm not used to selling stuff, okay? This is run around doing lectures, speaking, everything. That's not what I do for a living, y'all, to get the picture, okay? I have labs, I've got clients. I have 464 clients, and they're wondering, what are you doing out there talking to metaphysical people? And you need to be doing this stuff. I said, well, it's important. They need to know this stuff. So, something I hadn't done before, very rarely, nine months ago, I made a bunch of videotapes and a special effects studio. I brought videotapes with me. If you want to buy the stuff, you can see me afterwards. I'll be at a table in there. So much for the commercial plug, okay? You won't miss any of the stuff. I'll go on videotape, you can buy it. And audio tape. Okay, great. You can listen to my little voice and you drive around traffic going, that guy just cut me off. Talk to him, Dave. Hey, man, get out of the way. We're going to phaser, you know? So, anyhow, so much for commercial plug, but stuff available. Now, I want to back up to um, Corso. We have jumped in areas of technology so rapidly that it's hard to even keep up with. And I'll show you a stunning example. It's been right in front of you, and you completely missed it. How so? Here's a space shuttle. It's coming in in reentry. So here's the problem. It comes in, and the space shuttle is made out of aluminum. Now, it's got to slow itself up. If it doesn't slow itself up, it's going to have a problem. It's coming in at a moderate speed of 26,000 miles left. an hour. Okay? And if it doesn't slow itself up, it's going to use up a lot of runway and scare the heck out of the people in the runway. Now, how does it slow itself up? Well, it's going to pull its nose up, and it's going to use its belly, and it's going to hit the air. How many of you, I know a lot of you have, jumped in the swimming pool and do the old pink belly, right? You get up and your little tummy's pink. In my case, it's a damn tidal wave when it hits. So, why is your belly pink? Because you hit the water, the water could not get out of the way fast enough, you got friction, that's why you have a pink belly when you get up. Space shell's gonna do the Go same Go straight thing. on. It's gonna come in, it's gonna pull its nose up, it's gonna hit the Earth's atmosphere, it's gonna use the atmosphere to pull itself down. But we got a problem, we're gonna pick up friction. It's going to get a little warm up there, y'all. It's going to get up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The shuttle is made out of aluminum, which starts melting at 1,250 degrees Fahrenheit. So you almost got two and a half times the temperature to melt this thing. So one day, a guy named George Page walked into a room, a bunch of thermodynamic experts, just like you all, and he said, you just seen, you just seen the program. Believe me, they don't know any more than you do. So they think they do. So anyway... George says, you just saw the program of space shows. See all the nifty stuff we can do out there, but i got a problem. Every time it comes back in the Earth's atmosphere, it disintegrates. And I can't get any astronauts back here wanting to fly this thing. So I want you to build me a TPS system, a thermal protection system that can withstand 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's got to withstand, let's see, 8.5 million pound thrusting engines, or excuse me, 6.9 million pound thrusting engines for eight and a half minutes, like it is at launch. It's got to stand 250 degrees below zero, like it is in the shadows of space, and 250 degrees above, like it is in sunlight. So 500 degrees difference Go in straight space on. from light to dark. It's got to withstand total vacuum, x-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet rays. All right, it's got to withstand, let's see, temperature reentry. But I don't want it to burn up on the first reentry like all the other older bladed shields did. I want it to last 100 round trips before we need to replace it. Got that? Good. Where y'all head to the labs? One other thing. You know we're putting stuff in the cargo bay, right? We've got a weight problem. Can't weigh any more than a piece of styrofoam, same size. Can I have that tomorrow? Get them, George. So anyway, 12 years later, and one hell of a lot of failures, they ended up with this. A thermal tile from the Space Shuttle Columbia. And here it is. Been in space about five times. Got about two million space miles on it. Hardly even wore it out, okay? Now, it can do all the stuff that I can say it does, and it still weighs no more than that piece of material. See how heavy that is. Really heavy, isn't it? <laughs> Pretty light, y'all agree? Pretty light, huh? Good, I'll pay you after the show. Now, it weighs only much as a piece of styrofoam. Now, it can do all the stuff I said it can do, and a lot more, 
and I'll do a really searing demonstration. All right, that's really pretty neat. That's pretty impressive. No, that's pretty lame. So I need to do a better impression with that. And with that, I want to need somebody a volunteer. Anybody want to volunteer and come up here and help me with something? You'll do just fine. All righty, what's your name? Maya. Maya, okay. Good, Maya, hold that a minute. Well, this flat little lighter gets up to about 461 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not much of a deal. So I happen to bring this map gas torch I made. Now, this is not propane. I filled it with something called map gas. We will get up to about 2,600 degrees. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> smart girl. Stay perfectly calm. I've done this hundreds of times. I've only lost three people. Now, okay. now you know what happened to all my hair. So, we're going to walk over here in the dark a little bit. And if you would, Myra, come right over here. And we're going to do this. You hold the fire. You're lots, you had a, your first impression was right. You must be psychic. Now, I'm holding this thermal tile in my bare skin hand. Previous to this, all we've had was asbestos. Now, I want to show you something. This thing is going to get hot. Don't use any flash or you'll not get the fire out of it. It's going to get up to 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. And if I lean it that way, can you feel the heat? Hot, isn't it? All right, hold it right against it there, Myra. Now, that's only an inch and a quarter thick. Look at my bare skin on the back side and I feel no heat. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Think about that. But this stuff can do something no other substance on Earth could ever even achieve the hope of getting to. How, what's it do? It can isolate the BTUs in their orbits and leave the electron in an excited state. Well, what the heck does that mean? That means this. As Bullwinkle would say, there's not much lead. I will take my other bare skin hand, you hold the fire, I'll pull the tile away, and even glowing at 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit, I'll lay my skin flat on that cherry glowing surface, and it won't burn my skin. Let's see what happens. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, just a minute. Let me adjust my artificial hand here. Back to dead cold room temperature. Now, you want to explain to me how we jump from asbestos to this? because we had a little help. Because I tell you, there's, there's technology that's been flushing into the technological levels, and there is try to find trace originator resource on this. You can't. You will find that your paper trail will tell, I'll save you the trouble. It will take you to Sunny Bell, California, Lockheed Missile Space Company, who applies this to the space shuttle. And once you enter past that point, it's unknown. What's it made of? This is cool. I can even tell you the composition. 99.9 or 99.7 percent of it is made out of silica, the shiny stuff you find in sand at the beach. The other three tenths of material and how they make it is a Colonel Sanders secret recipe. Kit. So, go straight on. Think about that now. Corso is not off the mark. And if you think that infusion of technology is something, you should see um, some more stuff coming down the line in the very near future to a home near you. Do what? Good question. What's it cost? Raw material, three cents. NASA's cost $45,000 for this. Wait a minute, I'll, I'm going to defend them on this. Keep left. Because there are 30,200 tiles in every orbiter. No two are alike. There's this computer coding here. The paperwork on this one tile would fill half this room. That's why it costs so much. But the raw material, just pennies. What's the R factor? If we don't know, it goes clear off the scale. And what quarter inch of that is equal to two feet of fire brick. And unlike asbestos, I can lick on this all day biodegradable. Huh? Because if you, huh, all right, 
You're the commander of the shuttle, right? You're coming in atmosphere reentry. You have some kind of mishap, maybe you strike a micrometeor on the way in, and you blow a section of size of this wall off, it's going to warm your feet real quick. But if you have all little different sections, you only lose a couple and you'll still make it in. Safety factor. Okay. Go straight on. Now, um, at this point, pew. Um, wait a minute, I'll back up to one more thing you got to see. Um, and then I'm going to open up, let's see. Oh, God, we're out of time. How much, t how much time do I have? God, am I, I know what a contestant feels like on Let's Make a Deal, Bob Barker. What? 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 Okay. All right. Let me go just, I'm going to go one more project here, and then I'm going to open up questions. This one NASA doesn't like, because <laughs> I love it. It's so much fun. They don't want to know about it because it's embarrassing. I love embarrassing stories. So anyway, recognize that spacecraft, what was it called? Skylab. Now, something happened on Skylab that was very interesting. <laughs> it happened the very first day. The crews that were on board, Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo, they were all military pilots, all right? Very disciplined individuals. I mean, they're just like machines, and, and they make great individuals, and that was a good group of people to be using that for that kind of work. However, we got more advanced. We built a space station where we could do research. Don't need the pilots Go anymore. So they sent up a crew, and all this crew was all medical doctors, an entirely different animal. So they get these doctors up there, and they're not there more than 10 minutes. One of them pushes. Has anybody ever been in Smithsonian and seen Skylab, how big it is? Huge. Yeah, it's big as this room. Go so one on. doctor gets on one end, he pushes off, he goes flying through the room. All the other guys are floating around. Hey, cool, Frank, you know. Well, Frank's heading to the wall down there. Great doctor. Lousy physicist. He forgot something called momentum and kinetic energy. So what happens is he splats on the wall down there. He gets hooked on something, and he's laid his arm to the bone. Now, we've never even had anybody had a scratch. Now you've got a major problem. So, what's the whole crew? Doctors. No problem. They don't panic. They go over there, throw him up. They call back. Hey, I know we've only been up here for 30 minutes. And I know it cost $2 billion to get us up here. Uh, Frank's okay. We'd like to go on with the mission. Capcom standing there going, oh, God, go on with the mission, you know? So, anyway, three days go by, 96 hours. Doctors call back, they sound real strange. <coughs> Houston, we got a little situation. And the whole room goes, yeah, putt, man. <laughs> what now? So, Capcom stands up, he's the color of snow, and he goes, oh, God, now they killed somebody up there. So, uh, Go Capcom, straight on. we need a secured line and call in all the medical people. Oh, God. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm watching this. So they go, uh, we went to clean uh, the wound up here on Old Frank, and uh, I know it's only been three days, but when we pulled the bandage off, he doesn't even have a cut, he doesn't even have a scar, as if he never was injured. Why? And everybody standing there going, oh, it looks like a Chinese fire drill. So everybody goes in a panic, and, and then they find out something. You know what that something is? Everyone you, every one of you has the same human power as he does. And what happens? When a human body is unchanged from the field of gravity, 46 things change in your body. Anybody know that number? You should. It's your 8th grade biology. Right. It's the number of your chromosomes. The chromosomes make us up as individuals, so we all don't look like Pee Wee Herman, thank God. So, now, what happened was the chromosomes, when they're unchanged from the field of gravity, a chain reaction occurs, and what happens, we just don't understand. First thing that happens is it grabs the white corpuscles, the antibacterial defense system in your bloodstream, turns them into super white corpuscles, okay? A new way to look at age research. Next thing that happens Go straight is on. the gene start, not Levi's, y'all. Genetic gene material fires up, and the machinery of the body starts cranking out at an exponential level. Bottom line, you heal much faster in space than you heal here. 
Why good would that be? Well, imagine somebody badly burned in an airplane crash, house fire, or making a Pepsi commercial. Michael Jackson. Hey, Michael's all right. See, Michael didn't like drugs of any kind. <laughs> that boy don't need any. He always does. Um, anyway, what happens is, the reason he doesn't, since he doesn't like drugs, we started thinking about a whole situation here. So, keep right. I went back and then exit to the right. Back computer and asked a question. The reason I asked the question was because I did volunteer work when I had more time. Um, exit right. And I worked with the burn center unit. And man, I tell you, one day they brought in a little girl. She was burned. I couldn't tell it was a girl. She's burned 95% of her body, third degree, same as. Um, help me out here. The um, Malcolm X wife. Yeah. It's a good thing that she died because she would always been in constant pain. She was outside our envelope of technology to help, and that's a fact. Turn right. Plus, she would have made Frankenstein look like a beauty queen. So it's a really grim thing. After my experience, and I dealt with this little girl, and trying to work with her, she died. So that bothered me after a while, and I started thinking about this incident, and I went back to the med computers, okay? And I asked a question. What good with the healing technology we just learned with the chromosomes and the genetic materials could be applied to a massive burn victim. Here's what would happen. You take a massive burn victim, sedate them, put them in a liquid cocoon type transfer uh, container, and you take them up on a med shuttle and they wake up in a space hospital. First thing they would notice is no pain without any drugs. Why? Because the gravity field's not there pulling you to a surface level on a bed. Gravity is not there to pull the blood to the epidermis level, cause nerve endings to drop. You ever burn your finger with a match and feel your heartbeat there? Won't happen. Next, the cardiovascular system does not have to fight gravity to pump blood through damaged tissues from one end of the body to the other. Shock syndrome stops. Next, the number one killer of a massive burn victim is what? Airborne infection. You're in a total vacuum up there. Make the cleanest room in the hospital here look like a pig pen. Next thing, you have to feed nutrients into this person like a camel on a refill because their body's going to eat a lot of food. I forgot to tell you that astronaut was starving all the time. Couldn't figure out why. He was eating up so much stuff. He said, God, we're going to okay. catch this joy. Let's about to find a new route. Here. Get now we ready know why turn right. Frank was feeding the fuel into a turn healing right. engine. And finally, because of that, he or she would heal so fast up there, they would heal without scar tissue, not enough time to form. Welcome to my world. Okay. Pardon? Well, at the rate NASA and Congress move along, probably a couple million years Get after the second coming. Um, Turn <laughs> left. Somebody asked me how old I was the other day, and I said I'm two days older than dirt. Anyway, I'm going to stop at this point. And um, I'll answer some questions now. Yes. Whoop, microphone, oh yeah. Those of you who, <coughs> who want to ask me a question, just come up and line in front of the microphone here so we can all hear the question. So come on up and um, ask me anything about anything you want to know about, and if I don't know about it, I'll tell you I don't know. Three. Okay, he, <coughs> he asked if I could talk about helium three. Has anybody ever heard of helium three? Helium three is a substance that was found in the Apollo 17 moon rocks uh, and the University of Wisconsin in 1986. The rocks contained an element of, um, of helium that has an extra orbit inside it that is manufactured by the surface of the sun. It's deposited on the surface of the moon, courtesy of the solar winds, and 
is rather interesting. We knew that it existed, but it never really got here to Earth in any really major form because the ozone layer and the Van Allen radiation belt and all the atmospheres that layers we had stopped it from getting here. Well, so why is it so important? Well, the first thing that they did was they heated the moon rocks up, out came the gas of helium-3, they cooled the helium-3 down into a liquid, then they took the liquid and saturated a pile rod. That has nothing to do with hemorrhoids, okay? So anyway, <laughs> this pile rod is in <laughs> placed inside a nuclear reactor. And this reactor that they were using over in Europe is the Soviet breeder reactor. When they fired the reactor up, it jumped to about 97% efficiency, which if you know anything about reactors, that's just amazing because about 65% is the best we can get. But when they shut it down, they went in to check the radiation containment areas, had the same amount of radiation as you get in a barium enema. Clean thermal fusion power. There's enough of it laying on the surface of the moon to feed the entire Earth need for the next 10,000 years. Welcome to Helium 3. There's a whole ta I have an hour program on Helium 3. Okay, next question. Yeah, hi, I have 144 questions for you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Um, a quick question on the on the shuttle on the panels. Right. How are they held onto the shuttle, and what about the? Uh, how are they put together? You know, glued together. You said it. The shuttle tiles are glued to the shuttle. Um, actually, the way they glue it, first thing they glue is felt onto the aluminum. Then they glue the tile onto the felt. I know that sounds kind of strange. Oh God's name, we're using glue. Well, we can't use fasteners because the weight factor. 30,200 tiles times bolts and nuts would weigh more than a shuttle would. So um, <clears throat> they glue it. So what kind of glue are you using? Well, I'll give you this. The hotter it gets, the tighter the glue gets, which is the opposite of normal glue. The byproduct, the technology spin off of that was this. <clears throat> a researcher walked by, scooped up the waste. That's really good glue. It's really good. <laughs> it's it's so good, I could go to the hospital. That had cut his fingers apart. The waste product is super glue on a commercial sector. So you imagine what our glue's like. And really quick, um, on the uh, anti-gravity or the zero gravity, can't we create something here, uh, like a zero gravity chamber, instead of going to space to do these things? Yeah, well, y'all heard Pierre Sinclair, right? Not yet? Oh, he's after me? Oh, that's right. You hadn't heard about him. What a little yahoo he is. Where is he? There he is. I've known Pierre for, what, about 10 months now? Anyway, um, listen to what he's got to say because I'm procuring funding for both of us. We're going to finish his project. That man's got anti-gravity platform that will work. Yes. I have a question for you. Did you ever get an inkling from where the symbiotic engine technology came? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's far as I'm going to go with that answer. And I'm not being cruel to you, but I just, um, you got to appreciate my position. Um, I haven't retired, and I haven't stepped out of the loop. I'm up to my eyeballs in mainstream 3D world, and I, I've got to hold some things down because i got to work with them, y'all, you know. And they got yay much tolerance at times. Well, he's not a politician, at least, is he? <laughs> Second question. You've been around a long time, a relatively long time in the space program. Did we really go to the moon? Are we really on Mars? That's <laughs> two questions. Okay. A, you, a and B. Are you sure you're not a politician? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to insult you. Um, <laughs> politicians about useful as wet toilet paper. But... Um, <laughs> Yes, we really did go to the moon, and it's ridiculous to think that we didn't, because explain to me how come we could look live time through Mount Palomar and see the space vehicle on the surface. Also, explain the 1,278 pound of moon rocks, which we got helium-3 from, which is not indigenous from this area. So, uh, yeah, we went there. Part B, no. You're being duped, and it's so disappointed me that matter of fact a guy named over in Denver his name is Chip Tatum you ever heard of him Gene Tatum the 25 year deep cover CIA agent well you'll hear a lot about him he's the one that calls Ollie North to get busted they just let him out of prison last April all right he's a heavy-duty guy 
he brought me some newspapers and I'm going, God, Gene, you just had to do this. First newspaper is Orlando Sentinel and they got a live feed from the Cape because they wanted to scoop out JPL, okay? There's this really neat looking shot. There's the little rover right there and there's the big panorama view and sitting on the right corner on the surface about 80 feet away is this huge solar power panel. What? The solar power panel does not look like anything of the solar power panel on the little lunar rover. They're big old fat photovoltaic cells. They would evaporate in the atmosphere of Mars. It's a hostile system up there. No, what happened was when they got that shot, the next photo came through on all the other wires, the thing's gone. You know why? Somebody had to, hey, Bob, go out there and move that solar power panel out of the way. It's at Death Valley or someplace, and they're pulling a Capricorn One on you. And that, I never thought in my lifetime I'd stand up here and say something like that, because I'll definitely tell you we went to the moon, but they are definitely doing a number on you on Mars. You know why? Two reasons. First reason, funding is one, well, you hit a right on, on the funding part. The first probe that was built that went in that exploded when it entered orbit, you know how much it cost? One billion dollars. Keep you know right how much this probe cost? Exit right. Twenty. They put a cap. NASA put a cap at twenty million. Why did they put a cap? Because exit right. the contractor that built that probe twenty four hours later after it blew up in orbit got another rollover for left. one billion dollars. That's when I went nuts. I called the senators up and said, Hey, would you buy a car from these this morning and it Turn blew up left. and you buy another one tomorrow morning? No. You just did. That contractor changed out that locks, that oxygen tank on that craft two days or twice on the pad on the day of the launch to make sure you don't have a problem. No, to make sure you do have a problem. Because when they got an LOS, lost a signal, you can say Martians blew it up, Richard Holden can do all his crap and whatever God name he comes up with. But the fact is, it's just simple, common greed in corporate America and aerospace. And they did a contract rollover, all right? Now, so NASA comes back, I said, told the senators, I think 60 minutes need to know about this. Well, guess what? Three weeks later, NASA comes out and caps the building of the same probe for $20 million, and they build it. And I'm going, wait a minute. You're telling me you had a $980 million tooling ch charge? That's ridiculous. So, I don't think they had enough funding for that probe, but they did it for a couple of reasons. Ready the biggest right. reason is, one, did it land July 4th? What was going on exactly the same moment? Turn right. Roswell. I was there at Roswell, and they were having a live um, uh, briefing from the University of San Diego in Stanford University, and some Keep residents left. of Roswell were able to get hold left. of uh, some material and turned on to it for 50 years. These universities were given, given to them. They did these $100,000 hour uh, isotopic it's all tests. Over now. And I have the readout sheets with me. And guess what, folks? It's not indigenous to this area. There's a lot more testing needs to be done. But the whole point of this all is, while they were briefing this, the only cameras that were in the Pearson Auditorium was the foreign press. I went outside, down the steps, out in the street with the freaks and the geeks and the uh, airy fairies. People dressed in aluminum foil and antennas going everywhere. There's CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN. I'm going, hey, what are you guys doing down there? God mighty, here's a briefing up here, you know? They're just not looking. I go down right in the crowd. I'm shy, you know? So I grab the cameraman. What are you doing? He goes, we have our assignment. Yes. Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you. The uh, uh, Quest magazine reported uh, about two months ago that the British are working on a rail gun that they want to put into a mountain that's a 5,000 foot rail gun to launch vehicles into space. True. You know, you know to me, I hadn't heard anything about that. Hey, there is a limit to what I do know. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was on Cape Canaveral during the Mercury Apollo time period, and yeah, we did really go to the moon, okay? Real space program. Uh, my question is, you made a comment that NASA is not the NASA of that time period. Right. And they were not much then, okay? They were, the management of NASA was horrible. 
It was free absolutely, rough. they they didn't know how to manage anything. Uh, but I was curious as to what you had in mind relative to that. Well, you know, the management was difficult for them, but you got to appreciate what was going on. Look at it historically, y'all. Come on, I'll put it in perspective for you. We went from May 5th, 1961, getting Alan Shepard shot up in there, and July 20th, 1969, we're standing on the surface of the moon. In eight years, we went from a spacecraft that was the size of a, of a bathroom to a space vehicle that hurled three people and 450 tons of equipment a half million mile round trip. We did that in eight years. Jesus, name of God, there's nothing to compare to that kind of technological pushing. A lot of that was due to very dedicated individual effort, not... All of it was... Yes, it was. ...was because of the individuals that worked. That's the point I'm making. The people that worked there would have paid you to let them work there. They were so into it. It was their heart and soul. The people you got there now don't give a damn about nothing but getting a paycheck. I'm not going to say that for all of them, but the bulk of them is compared to the workforce you remember, to the workforce we have now, it's two different entities. It went from a can-do-anything agency to an, a faceless bureaucratic machine now. And that crap's got to stop. There's no, we led the world to another planet. That's too bad. That's really and we never went back. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> yes. uh, this may be a bit of a mute question if you've got access to an anti-gravity platform. But have you ever you know, thought about or given any thought to how we could privatize the space program so we get something done instead of waiting for NASA? Yeah. Uh, watch, watch the wording that uh, NASA's playing with. They say they're privatizing the space program. And, wrong answer. You want commercializing of the space program. Privatize means this. Do you know where the control center of the Hubble telescope is right now? Johnson Spacecraft Center, uh, you know, JPL? No. John Hopkins Medical Center. What? Absolutely right. Check it out. The control center of the Hubble telescope is in the middle of John Hopkins Medical Center. Why? A private contractor has it. And you know what the private contractor has in his clause? He does not have to show you a thing until six months later. You paid $1.5 billion for that and you can't even see until six months later, I think you should have a riot about that. That's ridiculous. Yes? Um, how come we never went back to the moon? I know there's a lot of people in here in the metaphysical community, oh, God, we got moon bases and all that stuff. Maybe you do. I haven't been there. I haven't seen it. I can't tell you it exists. I'm only going to tell you what I've seen, what I've touched, what I've felt. That's period, okay? As far as I know, we never went back to the moon. And why we didn't go back, that is the best question I ever heard, because that's the one I've been asking for years. Why in God's name don't we go back? Now, there could be thousands of theories, but I will have to admit to one thing. A normal, logical answer does not fit the question. There's no sense why we didn't go back. We should have never left. We should have stayed. I don't know why we didn't go back. Yes. Hi. Um, you seem to be an individual with a healthy level of skepticism. I was just wondering, given the fact that you're somewhat on the in on this, uh, what's going on, uh, why would you want to go uh, in front of a bunch of politicians in a, uh, and testify before Congress and in a closed session at a hotel where, first of all, nobody's ever going to hear what you have to say. It's never going to hit the light of day. And uh, uh, frankly, I don't know what it could possibly do. What, what were your thoughts when you were subjecting yourself to um, You ever heard the phrase, uh, curiosity killed a cat? Um, I was curious. If uh, they really want, I was thinking, it just might be a two-way disclosure. In other words, we tell what we know, they tell us what they know. And if that was going to happen, man, I didn't want to miss that party. So that's why I went, but it was a one-way communication street. They didn't, they know what they know, and they didn't say a thing about what they knew. That was my question to them. Why aren't you telling us what you know? You got all of us up here talking, you guys aren't saying squat, and you know the rest of the story, you're not telling us. So I just thought maybe I would have got in on, they may have done a disclosure, and I didn't want to miss that. And the second question is, uh, since you have done your uh, testifying, and you're going to be going for some more. Do you know whether or not 
this activity by any chance is going to be bringing any kind of quote unquote clamps down on you? Uh, no, and that's, that's an interesting thing. Well, maybe they will. I don't know. I'm audited all the time, so that's no big deal with the, with the IRS and use that. Um, when I saw all what I saw, I was 17. Under 18, I was a minor. They can't sign me to anything. So that was a little mistake on their part. Plus, I have a lot of lawyers. That's the other thing. And I know how to play the game. The, um, so, so far, I haven't felt anything. Uh, plus, they still want me. They, they, they want me. So that, if anything, they're probably my guardian angel. They don't want to make sure I don't get hurt. So they need me for other things, I think. But I, I've learned something from y'all. I love the concept. He asked, why did you think, you know, what were you thinking? That's what triggered it. It is said in your metaphysical community that we asked to come to this planet and take this life, right? If that's so, what in God's name was I thinking? <laughs> Why did I end up here? For God, I must have been drunk. They said, hey, Dave, you want to go to Earth all in humans? Sure, you know. <laughs> Jeez, what a choice. But, you know, after I got into this, this is really answering your question. The reason I went was because of you. I went there because I thought I'd try to make a difference for you. So, all of this stuff you see, you know, you go, sure, I can make a lot of money. I don't care about money. The thing I care about is trying to build a better world for you and your kids. Don't worry about your kids, for God's sake. So, that's why I do all that I do. I, I was born for one reason. You know, I work in quantum physics when I'm age seven. I was born on a dirt floor in Welch, West Virginia to coal miner families and such. And um, so I've come a long ways. And people go, oh, you're so great. You're so wonderful and all that. No, that's not it. These are gifts. They're divine gifts and talents. I would just happen to have been saddled with them. And <laughs> like a mule, I'm here to serve. That's why I came. I guess that's what I must have asked for. Because the whole thing I want to do is just leave this place in a better shape than when I found it. So. Thank you. Bye. Okay, 